This is number eight of the Folly of Good Friday. Uh, we're uh, looking at um, something, as I explained, that uh, Brian Mabry and I were, were talking about. And uh, actually, it was a study down the road. Uh, but I thought, well, perhaps this is no mistake. Uh, maybe in conjunction with this, I can simply draw the dumb numb gauge and, uh, and present it, uh, because we just uh, talked about it. And um, I think it's important because it is an answer. And the answer is to what's happening, and even the influence on all of us. Um, uh, the tendency not to want to learn is latent in the flesh. Um, the mind of the flesh is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. It's rebellious. It doesn't want to know. Because if it knows and the conscience is working, it's going to hurt. So the flesh finagles by saying and justifying, well, I'll just reject the truth or neglect the truth and remain in my ignorance. After all, says the flesh, ignorance is bliss. But the problem is there's reckoning down the road, both in time, eventually, and in eternity, if you're ignorant. And um, uh, uh, someone uh, asked, uh, am I uh, grouchy this morning? And the fact is, no, I'm not grouchy. Uh, it is not, uh, I'm not having PMS, pastor's MS. <laughs> I'm not having that. Uh, but I am weary, and the weariness is in all of my life, both with myself and with others, my struggle has been on just what I'm talking about, ignorance. If people only knew and wanted to follow what was right, there would be, there would be no problem. And then the next thing is, because they, they are dumb, you try to appeal to their reason, and they're unreasonable. Why? Because dumbness produces numbness, and you can't get through. The proverbial thick skull, that's what I'm talking about. And, uh, and the dumb numb gauge, the, the more your heart is darkened, and you can spout scripture, you can quote doctrines, you can say this, and if people reject the truth, they are numb to any, to any type of right and wrong. And that, that, is, that is a difficulty. And uh, it, it produces weariness of, 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 of that. So well, that's what we're talking about here. They, people knew the truth of God, but they chose to have their foolish heart darkened. When that happens, you become desensitized. Let's uh, look here to um, uh, verse number 23. Change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things. All right, there, there's a, a major darkening of the soul right there. God showed them what he's like, what he expects especially in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ and a relationship with him. They chose to darken their hearts. Now, the, one of the ways that they darkened it is by changing what God is. Instead of making God the sum total of what is right and what is wrong, note what they did. They changed it and made corruptible man so that Man, and then later on, you have uh, um, uh, beasts and, and birds and, and uh, bugs there, birds, four-footed beasts and creeping things, uh, being worshipped. Now again, I just remind you of what we uh, mentioned in the first hour. That is, that is demonism. Why are men looking to other men and then finally to brute creation to worship? Well, because the demons were bugs and beasts and birds. That's what they were way back when. Uh, and, and so it becomes these things that we look to. Just ask yourself the question. When it comes to any given situation of right and wrong, who do you want to please more? Is it some man who is leading you away from the truth? Or is it God? Who, and, and does it bother you that this person is, is, uh, is, um, is consequential? We're going to get into that in just a little bit. Uh, and and because we have talked about uh, consequential people, inconsequential people, and when a human being becomes more important to you than God, that person is your God. That person is who you want to please. That person is, is the one that you want uh, more than God himself. 
And therefore, if, you, if they're leading you astray, and by the way, well, we talked about them, uh, uh, the bird cages and the monkey cages and so forth. Jesus says, and we'll see this in relation to tradition, they're blind leaders of the blind and both, both fall into the ditch. And you say, well, what's so bad about that? Well, you have to understand that that word ditch in, in ancient times was the, was the privy hole, uh, was the sewer, open sewer of the city. And if you've got a blind man leading another blind man, eventually he's going to come and he, where are they going to fall? Into either the, the, the privy hole or the, the sewer, open sewer ditch of the city. So that, and, and there's the thing, they were talking about washing hands before eating. You just got to wash everything every single time. You just can't have the least speck of dirt or you're going to be defiled. And Jesus said, no, it's what comes out of the heart that defiles. And if you're a blind leader of the blind, here's the illustration. You're going to both fall into the most defiling place there is. The privy hole or the open sore of the ancient times. Uh, that's where the blind lead. But that's the point. Blind leaders of the blind. It's more important that you are illumined, as, as a Stan Ballard prayer, pray, that we are aware. We always talk about, well, we want to do this to make people aware. And yet, the most important awareness needed is your relationship with God through Christ and your sustained relationship through the Holy Spirit and doctrine. And people are totally unaware of that. And you say, well, isn't that most important? And it's that headlights uh, in the eyes of the deer stare there, you know. Uh, is that a car coming? As, uh, something's approaching at a high rate of speed. Should I move? And all of a sudden, boom, whack, he's gone. Well, that's the problem. They change the truth of God into a lie. It is the willful ignorance in order to darken the heart. Now, therefore, uh, we're going to address something here that is happening uh, around the world. For, and, and, and I've had people to say, I had a home family say about me ages ago, when I was a, as an unsaved teenager, thought the Beatles were hip and I started growing long hair. And I was just the cutest little thing, you know, just the sweetest thing. And uh, my dad being the military, yeah, it's hard to imagine now, but I did have it at one time. My dad, being the military man that he was, fussed about it. I'm glad he did. My coach would not allow it. I mean, no, you, you're a man or, or a woman or what have you. Okay? But, but even then, and the point that I'm making is, what we're having today is female demons in, in men and male demons in women, so that we have a change of the sexes. Whenever you darken the soul, you open up the matayotes in the soul, a vacuum. And what is sucked in there are seducing spirits with their doctrines of devils. So that you now have God gave them up. Why? To vile affections. Their women change their natural use to that which is against nature. This happens with, with the homosexuality. Lesbianism happens as a result of the darkening of the soul. And then you have this. Like uh, we had uh, uh, the uh, Evansville newspaper do a whole front uh, page spread on the drag queens that came in. Now, excuse me. <laughs> I, I mean, th there were these guys all, all gussied up, as it were, uh, and to that which is against nature. Likewise, men leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. Now, how did this come about? Why do we have men now? And, and people say, I don't see anything wrong with it. Um, I, I think the teenage boys, you know, with, with their dressing like girls, um, it's okay. Well, let's excuse it. What? What's wrong with that? Wait a minute. What are they? It doesn't take long to find out. Just strip them down and stand them in front of the mirror. And, and uh, you know, uh, it's quite easy to discern which sex you are. Therefore, dress accordingly. Well, what's happening is we are being dominated by male demons and females and female demons and males. And people are getting all confused as to, to what's right. And so, therefore, there is, there is the transsexual, cross-dressing, unisex uh, movement. And, and why is this? Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they dumbed their soul. That was a problem. They dumbed their soul. It, it, they, they, they're, a, they're a guy, but, and, they, and they see they're a guy, but they don't want to be a guy. They want to be a girl. 
Well, wait a minute. That's, that's dumb. Dumb and dumber. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. He did what? He gave them up. Why? Because there's a, even God can't get through to ignorance. After a while, you lose patience. God himself says, hey, they're too dumb for me. That's it. Dumbness is a big problem. Adam and Eve in the, in the garden. What did they choose? Instead of choosing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God, uh, excuse me, tree of life, which God said, you, you can eat of it. You can't. It says they knew. Immediately their eyes were opened and they knew. But what did they know? Truth? No. They knew good, human good, which God calls evil. They knew how to be evil and bring good out of it, humanly speaking. How to use God but get, and get away with it, they thought. Verse 32, here's the numbness. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Numb to it, justifying. Oh, well, you know, oh, well, just kids. Uh, maybe, maybe I am grouchy because uh, I, and we talk about dumb and dumber. I ate tacos at that Taco Bell a couple of days before I got sick. And there was no adult supervision in there. And I saw those kids in there playing with the food. And I thought to myself, you know, then you're, you're, you're kind of dumb if you do this. And lo and behold, on Wednesday night after the business meeting, I did it again. Dumb and dumber. Second action, dumber. There they were, playing in that food, no adult supervision, probably half-cooked meat, no care. More, I saw him in there impressing the girls and so forth. Ha, ha, he, he. The guy was sweeping up as they were preparing my food. He was sweeping the floor underneath where they were preparing my food. And I thought, well, no, okay. Uh, I'll maintain my gasket and so forth. And I ate, I took that food, went home, ate it, and got sick for a day and a half. Deathly sick. And... Um, but, but what is it? Is my ignorance? How stupid can you be? Uh, but yet, here, here's the, here's, this is the United States of America uh, for us. I guarantee you, um, Taco Bell, it'll be a long time before Taco Bell ever gets any business from me. You see, I, I learned my lesson. It was the school of hard knocks. It was a Louisville slugger, that big and that thick. And it, all right, where am I? Ephesians 4. And verse, verse 17. You see, there and there again is, is an appeal to the, to the mind and conscience who knowing the judgment of God, you know, you know what's right and wrong, but you have pleasure in them which do. It's more important that they think uh, you think they're all right and you want to please them and, and get their attention and affection. But at the same time, you are numbing your conscience to it because you know what's going to happen. If you really cared, you'd give them the light. You say, but because we just want to excuse it and, and so forth, um, we numb ourselves to it. Verse 17, this is what Paul is talking about. Here's a classic verse to show the dumb numb syndrome. The gauge simply shows that when you have this much illumination, you have this much stimulation on down to no, no light and no sensitivity. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that henceforth you don't walk as other Gentiles in the vanity of their mind. You see, there's the appeal to the mind. The vanity means emptiness. Now, mind you, something is there, but what Paul is talking about is that, is that what um, is not there is truth or light, the right thing. Having their understanding darkened. How? Middle part of the verse through the ignorance that is in them, through the blindness of their hearts. Note all those things that talk about darkening. A darkened, ignorance, blindness. And that's, the, that's the dumb part of it. 
Now, when, when you have a blindness of soul, oh, oh, I just can't see it. I, I just don't understand it. Uh, uh, when, when there is no light there, the soul becomes darkened and you begin to reprogram your conscience with other norms and standards. Why? So that the conscience will not hurt you. It is all an attempt to do wrong without feeling guilty. It is all of that's good and evil. I'm going to do what I want to do, be a master of my own fate, and I'm not going to hurt over it. So they reprogram their conscience. And so what happens? Verse 19, here's the numb part. Who being past feeling. It's the whole thing. If you're dumb, you're numb. The dumber you are, the number you are. Darker the heart, the, the more the soul's desensitized. And that's the way it is. Knowledgeability, therefore, is the answer. What does the Bible say? What is the rule? What's on the books? That's the way, uh, that's what we should go by. If you're not, you've darkened your soul to that fact. You're willingly ignorant or you've neglected the truth. Well, what does that lead to? It, it leads to a lack of sensitivity in your conscience so that you can more easily get away with sin and error without ever feeling that prick, that twinge, that uncomfortableness that, that comes with a properly functioning conscience. Okay. Now we're going to uh, go something, go to a place here. Uh, and again, I'm sorry I don't have these drawn more professionally, but have mercy on me. I was a sick little puppy this past week. And uh, I'm just afraid what I've done to that computer. I've had it malfunction bombed on me. So we, we have drew them this morning. But it, it, does, uh, it does tend to put you behind in everything you attempt to do. But we're not going to look at any verses of Scripture with regard to this. This will be something just like this other dumb numb gauge that we'll study in even more detail later. But I have um, been hearing and, and, and dealing with uh, things with regard to what is most important in life because I, I think that, that folks sometimes have a misunderstanding. And so I'll just simply ask you the question, taking us and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ with regard to a solution. You see, most people try to deal with symptoms, but with me and, and, and God, um, it is dealing with the problem. Or they want to deal with symptoms, we want to deal with, pro with the problem, the root cause. Why is that important? Because simply if you deal with a symptom, it's just like, just like I felt my, my stomach was upset, my brain felt like it was coming out, I, I told the, the doctor I want something for, for uh, my head and, and my stomach and so forth, something to correct the problem. So what does he give me? Instead of something for, the, for the, the stomach, he just simply gives me some pain pills to mask the symptoms of the problem. And so about every four hours, guess what happened? When that which masked the symptoms was done, what happened? <laughs> the, the problem reoccurred. And hey, doc, wait one second. You're the one with the PhD, or the MD. Uh, hey, you do something to get rid of the problem problem. But people today want to deal on just symptoms. It's always failures. It's always losing. It's always doing wrong and so forth. And then trying to recover and start over. Now, praise God, forgiveness is incorporated into his plan and, and program for us. We all need it. However, continually being a loser and a failure and, and acting in imperfection after countless times of saying, well, now wait, this is the way it's supposed to be. It shows again what we're talking about, dumbness and numbness. Take the life of Christ in us. He was a human being, you are a human being. Who glorified God more? The guy who did not sin and remained in perfection or those of us that have sinned countless times and go back to imperfection and need restoration. The one who did not sin or the one who sins and asks 
um, God to restore them all the time. Who glorifies God more? The, uh, is the answer not very obvious? To me it is. The one who glorifies God more is the one who does not sin. He didn't sin. Who glorified God to the maximum? Jesus Christ. Why did he do that? Unlike the first Adam and the rest of Adam's children, he chose never to sin. Who glorified God more in the angelic conflict? Jesus Christ. Why? Because he didn't sin. He obeyed. We'll look at some verses. Well, as a matter of fact, I said we wouldn't look at verses. Uh, that's evangelistically speaking. We'll look at Philippians chapter 2. The whole idea in the Christian way of life is not to try to, after being taught, 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 say, well, now, I'm imperfect, uh, I'm a failure, I'm a loser, just to restore, make up, and go on. It is to stay a success and a winner. Where is the precedent for that? Jesus Christ. Yes, forgiveness is there, but when we have sinned, we don't glorify God. God is not glorified in our sin. Verse 5, Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What was his mental attitude? He was in the form of God, but he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he's going to enter the human race if that was the will of the Father. He had become a man. He made himself of no reputation, among men that is, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man. And here's the key. He humbled himself. Arrogant, hypocritical people are imperfect. They know, but they, but they do not do. And it ends up in God judging them here or them having, do you have to have the rebound technique? Now we're glad the rebound technique is here. But the rebound technique is an excuse for a failure. It's an excuse for a loser. Don't, don't you un understand? It's an excuse for a loser. Every time I have to use the rebound technique, I have to think of myself. I failed. I failed God. I failed myself. I failed others. The re rebound technique, we're, we're glad the grace of God has provided it to restore fellowship. However, it is, no, it is nothing more than an excuse for a loser to get back in fellowship and start all over again. Let me, let me point out, Jesus Christ never lost. Jesus Christ was always a, su a success. Jesus Christ was perfect. And we say... What is the ideal in the Christian way of life? To be like Christ. I simply point out to you, asking the question, what was he like? He was perfect. Now I know that in this life we're never going to be sinlessly perfect, but yet that is the goal and the objective. And, and to continually look back on, well, we've got the rebound technique there to fall back on. We'll just go ahead and sin. That's what the Apostle Paul was saying to the Romans. Shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? Whoopee! I was sinking deep in sin. Whee! You know, and, and so forth. Uh, that's what we used to sing at camp years, years back. I was sinking deep in sin. Yay. All right. No, it's not going back there. Though it's, it's, it's a potential if we fall. It is going on to, Hebrews, perfection. Learning enough to stay in fellowship with God the Holy Spirit. Being Spirit-filled is a state and condition of perfection. Now, it doesn't mean that we have eradicated the sin nature, but we have, we have um, neutralized it. That's a, that's a great word. So that for all practical purposes, it's gone until uh, we, we begin to be drawn away uh, again and, and let the Holy Spirit go His way and we become imperfect. If you're filled with the Spirit and the Spirit is making you in the likeness of Jesus Christ, what is that but perfection? It can't be anything else. He never sinned. All right, let's move on. He humbled Himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And there is the key, obedience. When we are imperfect, it's because we want to disobey either direct divine commands or uh, any of the laws and the power people in, in the institutes of divine establishment. By the way, even like with the, his, his mom and dad, Jesus Christ was, uh, became uh, submissive uh, to them and their authority. Uh, wherefore God highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name. 
So why do we put the, uh, point this out? Is because the solution to imperfection is perfection. That, that's it. You don't go to heaven unless you're perfect. Well, of course, what God did was take that which was perfect and identify it with that which is imperfect. But even then, unless you personally are identified with that which was perfect, what he did on the cross for you, you still remain uh, in your imperfection and you go to hell. Uh, unless you go to the cross and stay there with the obedient mindset of Christ in your life, you're still going to be imperfect and still going to be displeasing to the Lord. The God solution is the perfection solution. It is identifying with perfection first at the cross, secondly with the mind of Christ uh, in doctrine. Okay. Well, I've been, even though I've been sick, I've been a busy little boy here. Let's go to Second Thessalonians, chapter three. Now, we're, we're slowly but surely beginning to focus our attention back on where we are with um, the folly of Good Friday. And actually what we've been talking about um, are traditions and how man-made commands, traditions, and doctrines have made us dumb to what is real and numb to our responsibility so that uh, we go through the course of, of a year and the world does this and they don't have any problem with all of these holy days. Uh, hey, that's part, of, that's part of their works program or that's part of what we do at this time. And it gives us, varieties the spice of life and it's different. You have this emphasized at this time, this emphasized at that, that time. And so it, 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 it's all part of it. What are you fussing about? Well, what I'm fussing about is dumbness and numbness. And and then also, and uh, just before we get back to, to the tradition, I want to, um, this, is, this is part of the study, to ask us all, I, I, I do, definitely do have the gift of pastor teacher or pastor being a shepherd. And one of the reasons that I do, I know that I have that is because oftentimes I hurt from a sheep. Um, uh, things which could not possibly in any way affect me otherwise affect me because, well, I know my sheep are hurting. Well, I wish I had an answer. Um, sheep are going through difficult situations. Sometimes they are difficult situations because of testing. And all of us have, have the test. It was a definite test that I did not fire, firebomb um, Taco Bell this past week. It was a definite test that I didn't go in there like a disgruntled postal employee with an AK-47. Because I, I thought about it, but then, no, uh, what, would, what would my sheep do? Got to feed my sheep. Feeding was part of my problem. Anyway, um, so part of it is a test. But then sometimes it's, it's because, and, and this is something I want us to think about. And again, it's just over the course of the years in, in even recent days, things, people have said things and well, why is this happening to me and so forth. And so I put my brain to work because I too want to help them overcome whatever it is, whether it's a, a test or whether it's a genuine spiritual problem that is causing these things. So we're, we're going to think about this in light of what Paul has said. And it, and it came to me um, as I uh, was sick uh, here uh, about this. Verse number six. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walks disorderly and not after the tradition that you, which he received of us. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Now, 
Here is the consequential and inconsequential person. Here is when a human being becomes your God or God is your God. When that person, their friendship becomes more important to you than following God. When that happens and you have another God in your life, then, uh, then judgment is sure to, to come to you. Why? I should have no other gods before me. So in, in thinking of, of difficulties and circumstances, think of, of people in our lives that influence us. Is there someone, for example, that is, and we'll see in a minute, that has walked out of ranks, and here you are in the ranks, and that person has drawn you to leave the ranks. You once were faithful to church, you're no longer faithful to church because of this person. Um, you once were faithful to the grace message, but you're no longer faithful to the grace message because of this person. Um, you've considered leaving the grace message. You've, you've considered uh, uh, following them in their folly uh, and because they're so important. Now I'm, I'm talking about family and friends. Who is more important? What is right? And does it bother you? Is your conscience convicted or do you, do you say, well, though that person is thus and so and thus and so in my life, they're inconsequential to me. Yes, but pastor, aren't you going to pay consequences? Yes. But let me ask you this. Who's going to give you more grief? The displeasure of that human being or the displeasure of God? Who's going to hurt you more? This person who can only hurt your, your body or God who can affect your eternity? Who's more important in your life? That you would follow a human being? Now, uh, again, you know what that would do to me? That would make me say, okay now, uh, that, that puts things in a different light. Yes, who are you following? And that's why I'm pointing out the blind leading the blind. Jesus himself gave a similar example to this. Who is so important that they are leading you astray? Obviously, if they're not leading you to the truth, it's seducing spirits and doctrines of, of devils. But why? It's because you knew God, but you didn't glorify him as God and made him like a man. What does that mean? A consequential person. Oh, I just have to live with this person. I have to be friends with that person, that person's family. And so therefore, I just have to be in good terms with them. Well, why? Well, they've, they've gone this way. And so I, I can't ever hurt their feelings by, by slighting them with the truth. What does that make them? That makes them more important than God. That makes them your idol. That makes them the, the image you bow down to. That makes them the person that you worship. Oh, how, how great they are. Oh, yes, I'm in good favor with them. Good stead with them. Forget about God. It's more important to have this temporal relationship with this nutcase here than, than to be in right relation with God. And I'm telling you, those, if those people are, don't become inconsequential to you, that you're going to end up doing just what, what um, others do. Being a follower of a blind person following in the, in the ditch. So let's go. Verse number six. This comes by way of a command. It, and actually, the word uh, command here, uh, para, uh, paraangelo, has to do with passing down. And here's where the tradition comes in. Passing down from soldier to soldier in the ranks, the command of the officer in charge. And the only way you can generationally hand down from, from, from one person to the next is to be in the ranks, or, or the ranks that Paul has established, and that is his point. He's giving us a military illustration, and there you are in the ranks, and Paul says, do this. And that soldier is to tell the next soldier, and then that soldier, the next soldier, on down the ranks. So, if somebody is missing from the ranks, what's going to happen to the soldiers on down below? Well, they're not going to get the information. That's the whole point here. So it is a command, parangelo, to hand it down through the ranks. The responsibility there is incumbent upon those in the ranks to maintain their stand. Get the message and hand it down. The only way they're going to win in this war is if everybody gives a concerted effort to the goal of defeating that enemy. Therefore, the good soldier doesn't go A-W-O-L. He stays 
in the ranks. Now, how does this come? By way of command. Secondly, he commands it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what's so significant about that? The word name there is a title that Christ won in the angelic conflict as a human being. We just read it in Philippians. He humbled himself to the point of the cross and God gave him a what above every name? A name above every name. It is his highest rank and authority as a human winner in the angelic conflict. So he is commanding us to, to do this. Now what is he commanding us to do? It is the Greek word stello in the present middle infinitive. And uh, stello means to stand. If you put the Greek uh, prefix apo in front of it, it means to stand away or to send away. Apo, stello, apostle uh, type deal is the, the connection there. To stand, stand away, to send away. But stello by itself means to, to stand. Present tense, continually stand. Middle voice, to stand for your own benefit. You're going to be blessed there, not in trouble with the commanding officer if you stand. The infinitive gives its purpose. Why are you standing in the ranks? To transmit the message down the ranks. Leaving the ranks leaves a, a, a gap there, and the people down below you in the line are not going to get the message because of your irresponsibility. So he says, withdraw yourselves, and there's the word stello, from every brother that walks disorderly. Now, you say, Pastor, now wait one second. How can you withdraw if you're standing? Easy. Who's the person doing the walking here? The brother that walks disorderly. And the word disorderly means out of the ranks. Stella means to stand in the ranks. Who was the one withdrawing? The brother. It simply means that if they're going to be dumb enough to leave the ranks, irresponsible enough to leave, leave it, you maintain your place. Yes, but shouldn't we go get them? No, the command is you stand. And to the degree and distance that they leave their place in the ranks is the degree and, and distance that you are withdrawing yourself from them. The fact of the matter is they're responsible for the, for the withdrawal. Jim Shackelford used to say something that, that I, really, I really liked when he said, um, if God and you are out of sorts, guess who moved? You know, if you're away from God, guess why? Who left? One God. God's still where he always is. It's you. Now, and that's the same thing here. If somebody leaves the ranks, hey, um, excuse the phrase, too damn bad. If you are going to be some that irresponsible, too bad. If, if that's what, you're inconsequential. Now, it's not that we wish they would. It's not that we hope they would. It's not that we don't pray for. It's not that we would not do everything. But our responsibility is to stay in the ranks. That's where we, we should be. And not following others off. Now, and I, and I ask, if, if following them, befriending them, is more important than staying in the ranks and, and troubles have ensued, ask yourself, wonder why? Are they, their friendship, their fellowship, more important than your responsibility to stay in the ranks so that generationally, the traditions of Paul rather than the man-made traditions that they're following after uh, will be supported uh, in the long term.